What if you could prompt videos in real time and control it just like you do a video game? Well, that is exactly what Google's announced today with Genie 3. I've had an early look, so let me break it down for you. What you're seeing is a real time AI video generation at 24 frames per second at HD resolution. You are literally prompting worlds into existence that you can navigate just like you do another video game. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably saying, Bilavel, this is not real 3D. And while that is true, this model has really good memory. So things stay self-consistent and you can even make changes into the world that persist over time. And that's really impressive because they're doing the frame generation autoregressively, which we'll get into later. So let's take a look at this example. If you're painting the wall, you move on over, make some other paint marks on the wall, and then you look at other parts of the scene now that you're generating because you're seeing them for the first time. And then when you look back, everything will persist. That is mind blowing. And because of this architecture, if you want to have different things happen in the scene, you just prompt it to do that. And it happens in real time. Like say a man in a chicken suit appears or a jet ski whizzes by or something far more fantastical. You could do it all and there are simple text prompts that you can drop in as events throughout the experience. It does really well with physics, underwater scenes, the list goes on. And we're gonna take a look at a bunch more examples and use cases in the rest of this video, including some that you won't see anywhere else. But just to put things in perspective, here's where we were with Genie 2 just seven months ago. Can you imagine where we'll be in just a few years? So take a look at this, like Genie 2 stopped at about 10 or 15 seconds. At 10 seconds, it stops. Um, and Genie 3 goes on. And just look at the high frequency details, the reflections, the refractions. I mean, it's like getting uncomfortably close to AAA game engine quality. So if this is where we were seven months ago and this is where we are today, can you imagine where we'll be in just a few years? I'd say Jensen was right. Every pixel will be generated, not rendered. So if you take a really jaded point of view and you say like, why is Google making a shittier game engine? Think about it. This has huge implications far beyond video games. We're talking about generative worlds for robots, training and simulation like disaster planning and evacuation planning and so much more that we'll get into in the rest of this video. Now, before we go into why Genie 3 is so unique, let's compare it to the current landscape. And this table does a really good job of describing this. A game engine, if you don't remember a game engine, this was basically the Doom paper that went stupid viral a few months ago, where essentially a neural network, it's a neural network that's letting you play Doom in real time. That's kind of wild, right? But of course, if you think about it, this is game specific and the interaction horizon was just a few seconds, uh, even though it was real time. One might really make the case here is like, homie, why the hell are we trying to play Doom on a fricking using a really expensive GPU and a neural network when you can play it on your like TI-89 calculator? Fair point. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got VO, right? Like VO3 is like, Clearly, state of the art, one of the best video models out there. It can do everything from 720p to 4K generation. But of course, the interaction horizon is the eight second clip that you generate. And really the interaction latency is like from a short number of minutes to a long number of minutes to generate every single video. And of course, the control that you're giving the model is this video level description for each of these eight second clips that you're generating. Kind of in the middle was Genie 2. So Genie 2, as I mentioned, came out in December of 2024. And it was pretty cool. Like it let you do all these cool things. Like if you got a piece of 2D concept art, you drop it in there. Suddenly you can do a little bit of play testing and fly around, just see what the vibe of that environment would be. It would also model some physics effects and physical interactions like blowing up like a whole case of gasoline, things like this. It felt a lot more like it was for prototyping, right, at this point. So as you can see, these various models excel at different tasks. But the Google DeepMind team asks, what if you could have the best of all worlds? You could get 720p resolution, general domain, so in terms of generating whatever the hell you want, not something specific to a game 
or certain 3D environments. So for example, that's exactly what Odyssey ML is doing, basically creating these outdoor walkabout scenes where it's like brimming with life, but you're kind of limited to the data that they're training on, seemingly. In this case, you want to do photorealistic, stylized, cinematic, boom, you could do it all. And critically, you've got navigation, but you can also prompt world events. And you can do this all with a multi-minute interaction horizon where everything stays self-consistent with a real-time latency. Now look, consistency is exceedingly important and Google has made a serious leap here. Here's one of the exclusive examples I got to demo over video chat. And essentially, you know, you're like a wildlife photographer capturing this animal. And as you can see, as the animal is walking, it's leaving footsteps that persist. And as you get closer to it, you can walk and inspect that trail. It's really, really cool to see this level of self-consistency happening at such a long horizon. Like multiple minutes is kind of wild. And what makes this particularly impressive is they're doing the frame generation auto regressively. So basically frame by frame by frame by frame. But the model of course has to take into account the entire trajectory, the path that the user was walking and all the actions that it did, including painting on the wall, leaving footsteps, and keep that stuff consistent with all sub every subsequent frame that is generating. And this is really challenging, right? The longer the duration you're exploring the world, the more inaccuracies that you're gonna accumulate sort of over time. And so despite that, it does pretty freaking well. What's really mind blowing is they note that this consistency is an emergent capability. Like other methods that exist that we've covered extensively on this channel, like neural radiance fields and Gaussian splatting, do give you this self-consistent 3D environment, but you've got this sort of explicit underlying representation. These worlds are far more dynamic, right? Everything's generated frame by frame. So things can be static, things can be moving. You know, so here's an example of me walking around a large scale Gaussian splat of a forest. Right, like so this scan is immaculate. It took forever to do, and yes, you can walk around it, but everything's gonna be static. Now you could take offline video models, right? Like something like Gen 3 or Gen 4 and reskin it, and that's kind of cool. Or maybe even think about doing it in real time like I am with LCM Laura over here. But it feels like that's a lot of steps to do what Google is just doing with one. Now, I will say, if you're looking for sheer visual fidelity, especially all the light transport effects and interactions with a static scene, you're probably going to get a better result with like reality capture. But again, the key magic with this approach is you can have promptable world events. So maybe I started with that capture, maybe a photo of a real environment, and suddenly I want to make it rain. Suddenly I want to add a character. Suddenly I want a car drive in from the right. Suddenly I want to have a character sit into it. The same way we're finding this like emergent property in VO3, right, where you can kind of scribble on it to prompt it. Think of how much more intuitive it is to be able to have these timestamp prompts to basically have changes occur over the course of a video and you see the result in real time. All right, so now let's take a bunch more examples and talk about the use cases. So here's a funny one that I got to see live yesterday, which is basically like a cat walking around a living room. And just look at the lighting, like from the windows, the God rays, the physics, let's see. The cat tries to jump up on the couch, boom, makes it. <laughs> the exposure shifts that happen as you look around too. I mean, to think about all these crazy rendering techniques that have to be explicitly coded, these models are understanding implicitly. It's really, really mind blowing. Like when it goes into the shadows, into the light beams over there, and you see the shadows casted on and its fur reacts properly, it's just mind blowing. And so it's crazy to look at this terrain, right? This is like basically real time terrain generation. Like <laughs> it's kind of trippy. Um, but you could do so many cooler things. Uh, for example, if you are driving a boat down the Venice Canal, it's it's kind of funny. It's like a game engine, but it's got the photorealistic quality of like an FPV or a GoPro YouTube video. And that seems to be one of the changes that they did talk about, which is sort of like um, Genie 2 was trained on a lot more like 3D environments, whereas Genie 3 seems to have a similar training data set to VO. Just think of the hours of like walkabout footage that you find on YouTube, suddenly it all becomes playable. That's kind of crazy. Another limitation they did note in the blog is that the accuracy of real world locations is approximate. So kind of think of it like the early days of diffusion models. Things were an approximate facsimile of what you see in the real, in reality, uh, it's not gonna be one to one. Speaking of which, if you wanna go really back in time and I'll create like a, 
you know, learning simulator for kids to see like, what was ancient Rome like? What was the vibes back then? You could create experiences like this. Super factual depiction maybe isn't as important as having a decent approximate one just to get a sense for what the feeling and what the vibe was. I also love that it automatically generates a human embodied avatar so you can see the human shadow there in the bottom. Now this is both again, a really good memory test. That's the objective of it, but it also shows you the potential for augmented and virtual reality. Like if you're just able to pipe out like stereo pairs of this image and you maybe could just do that with a model itself because if you can move left and right, you could create the right eye view and the left eye view in near real time, right? Or maybe you have two GPUs doing the heavy lifting. Now look, as it looks around the window, it's generating the parts of the scene that it hasn't seen. You can kind of see a little bit of the fuzziness as it looks over past the occluded bits of the window as the generation uh, continues. But then when you go back inside and you go look at what was on the chalkboard over here, everything is consistent, including the double cupped cup. So, hey, that's pretty freaking awesome. And also makes me excited about maybe there's something cool we could do with our Vision Pro or Quest 3 headset. Now, if you think about it, AR, VR headsets are sort of half robots. Like we got a lot of the sensors that a robot would, but we're the ones taking the action for full robotics training, right? Like creating a jungle gym for robots, a simulation made from real world data to train robots to then operate in the real world is something that NVIDIA has been focusing on with Omniverse and Cosmos, where they kind of try to blend the best of both worlds by having this like 3D simulation engine, Omniverse, and then Cosmos to kind of put a diffusion pass to add all those edge cases. Um, this kind of bypasses it all together, right? Like if the bitter lesson holds true and you can just keep scaling up this type of approach, you might not even need that explicit underlying 3D representation. And you can kind of skip to the step where, you know, uh, NVIDIA is using something like Cosmos to add like variety of different weather conditions, like foggy, oh, like, you know, it's super clear, it's snowing, et cetera, right? Like you could get that directly with these promptable events that we talked about. You can generate those things with existing data that you have and augment it or create it completely from scratch. This is another really impressive one. It's a nighttime shot where you're on a jet ski. You can see your rear view mirrors. I don't know how accurate they are at the moment because I asked about this. And right now they haven't focused on sort of multi-view generation. They're focusing on just single video um, uh, playability for the moment. But notice as it walks around this sort of nighttime scene, clearly in East Asia somewhere, and you go and like and bump into some of these things. Like, oh, you stop, right? And you got that little... Uh, Newton's laws of motion are being followed and adhered to by this model. What I'm personally most excited about really is like the casual play example. Like I capture a lot of these scans in 3D, but they're not brimming with life. Like the water isn't flowing. The fact that I could have some sort of a capture like this and notice the exposure shift, by the way, as it goes through the trees over there, that, you know, that felt like Unreal Engine. And this is happening in real time. How crazy is that? What other emergent properties are we gonna find as these models scale up? Now, the last example I wanna show you is this one, like for you know, disaster planning and evacuation planning, like how do you create all these edge cases of like, what is it like if you're being hit by a tsunami or tornado? These type of phenomena, right? Like water is traditionally exceedingly hard to simulate in 3D game engines or even offline digital content creation tools like Houdini. You're gonna be doing this like open VDB simulation, baking it down, tossing it in there. And how do you have like a real time interactions? That's super, super tough to do. And video games have found historically all sorts of hacks to make this happen. Well, now you can generate it on demand. That's insane. Now, Google also has this interesting agent called SEMA or Scalable Instructable Multi-World Agent. Basically, it can follow natural language tasks to play video games, like do stuff in video games. Google, of course, set this agent to work against their new Genie 3 model, and it absolutely works. Like, so this is so cool, right? Like, since what SEMA reacts to is like, hey, here are my keyboard events, and then it just reads the frame coming back, it doesn't actually care if the underlying representation is like a 3D engine that's like rendering pixels or this sort of generative approach. So maybe we should care less too. And if that's something you're interested in getting into, check out this video that I made a while back, seven months ago, right actually when Genie 2 came out to compare the state of the art. 
when it comes to things like Google's Cat 4D to generate 4D 3D renditions that are explicitly renderable or the stuff that Blockade and World Labs is doing and comparing it to Genie and sort of which use cases make the most sense for which technology stack. Now, I suspect the debates will continue and I can't say much more, but there are some very interesting launches on the horizon. Unfortunately, I'm embargoed until those launch dates to talk about them. But needless to say, I will be covering it here on this channel. So if you enjoy this video, please be sure to hit that like button, drop a comment below and tell me what you think about Genie 3 and what would you like to see me cover next? Bilavo signing off and I'll see y'all in the next one. Cheers.